So I will be talking to you today about Lebanon and what it is going to look like in the next 12 months. Uh, this particular presentation was a project we did for our political risk and forecasting class taught by Dr. Glancy here. And so we're going to discuss the future of Lebanon over the next 12 months and then the analytical methods used to come to this conclusion. So the judgment I found was the current status quo in Lebanon will not be sustained over the next 12 months. The current status quo in Lebanon is that they do not have a uh, properly elected president. They have not had timely uh, parliamentary elections. However, civil unrest has been peaceful with uh, five or less cases of physical violence or death by protesters or against protesters. Um, I have some high confidence that the Lebanese parliament will elect a new president, president excuse me, in the next 12 months. So just a little bit of background. Lebanon has had a pretty rough couple of decades. Uh, they survived a civil war, Israeli occupation. Um, they were run by the Syrian government for a while post-civil war. And they have set up a confessional uh, democracy system. And in this system, their parliament of 128 seats is divided between Christians and Muslims. It's divided <coughs> evenly based on uh, a census that was done. However, the last census was completed in 1932. So, yes. <laughs> they don't want to complete another one because Christians are afraid that they are no longer equally represented in the country and therefore will lose states, uh, seats in parliament. Um, the Lebanese parliament has held 38 elections for president in the last two years. They've had an acting president since 2014. However, as sad as it sounds, they do not have enough members of parliament to show up to even take a vote. Um, currently, the active president is Tamar Salam, and he is a Sunni. He was previously the prime minister. Um, in the confessional system, the president has to be a Maronite Christian, the prime minister needs to be a Sunni, the speaker of parliament will be a Shia, and then the deputy prime minister will be a Greek Orthodox. And so this is a very big sticking point because they do not have a Christian president. And they have a Sunni president as well as a Sunni prime minister. And especially the Maronite Christians as well as the Greek Orthodox do not believe that this is a proper representation of the government. Lebanon has also not had a parliamentary election since 2009. The people rep uh, elect their parliamentary representatives every four years. Um, <coughs> due to regional instability, in 2013, Parliament extended its mandate for another 31 months, essentially pushing off uh, elections until 2017. Most recently, um, and this actually made American news Civil society is taken to the streets because Parliament had closed the waste management facility and so garbage collection ceased. And so the streets filled up with trash, people couldn't get to work, there were a lot of hygiene issues and this is when civil society began protesting. Now the protests ceased and broke down because they became violent and the organizers of the movement wanted a peaceful protest. So one of the methods we learned in class and used to uh, determine our outcomes in our different countries was economic analysis. Um, Beirut used to be called the Paris of the Middle East and was a very big tourist destination for Middle Eastern countries as well as Gulf countries and North African countries. Um, however, Standard and Poor's and Moody have recently lowered uh, Lebanon's credit rating to a B- and a B2, respectively, and they've also given it a negative outlook. So it's likely to be uh, reduced again. The country's growth rate is only supposed to reach 0.7%, so they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, a large chunk of Lebanon's economy comes from remittances from work from other countries. So. Lebanon suffers from a serious brain drain. There's not enough jobs in Lebanon for educated people to allow those people to get jobs. So they go elsewhere, they come to the United States, they go to Europe. Most of them go, though, to uh, 
Gulf Cooperation Council of Countries. So Syria, uh, no, wait. Syria, the UAE, Qatar, and uh, countries on the peninsula, they've gotten together because of Hezbollah to start expelling these workers. Um, Saudi Arabia has also halted $3 million in foreign military aid, which significantly cuts uh, what they can pay for as weaponry, as well as what they can pay for soldiers. And the military is the largest source of jobs in the country. Mm. They've also enacted travel bans to Lebanon, and tourism makes up 20% of the country's GDP, and they're expected to lose over 60,000 tourists from these countries. So it puts a big strain on their economy, and that is part of the reason why there's so much civil unrest and strife, because you're able to go to college in Lebanon, once you finish college, you can't get a job. Um, foreign policy analyst doesn't give the situation much more hope. Um, Hezbollah, which the United States considers a terrorist group, it is a Shia militia group, um, originally established to fight Israel, um, now has a very big political wing. They run for seats in parliament, they provide civil services to society. Um, and so, in general, the country breaks down on the March 8th alliance and the March 14th alliance, which we can boil down to pro-Syria and anti-Syria. So in general, the Christians will rally around either a pro-Syrian president or an anti-Syrian president and parliamental vote. This has become quite complicated. We now have two pro-Syrian presidents, March 8th alliance, who are now up for election. One is Michelle Un, and the other one is Salim Franjal. And what you, I'm not sure if you can read the graphic, but what you can see from the graphic is people were supporting each other based on party lines and alliances, and now it's kind of all gone to hell. So you have March 14 Alliance supporting March 8th Alliance, you have Hezbollah supporting both candidates, and therefore alienating a large part of the population, which is why these uh, parliamentary members don't show up to elections. We also did some scenario and systems analysis, and this is used to kind of tease out outcomes. There are a lot of different ways this scenario could end. It could end in civil war, a military coup, all-out violence, or parliament could get their crap together and elect a president. Um, and just to kind of show you how the systems analysis works, oh, come on. Can you see this? No. Forget me. To see how the systems analysis works, these are all the different factors that make up the situation in Lebanon. You have internal violence, you have economic slowdown, you have a successful infrastructure. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Civil unrest, regional stability, um, and then the influence of Iran, the influence of the United States, and it looks like a mess. And it really is when you layer everything in. What systems analysis allows you to do is let's look at an Islamic extremist presence. So ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda, and these are the, the different things it affects. You have a higher likelihood of an extremist attack. You have a larger refugee population contributing to this ISIS presence. You have ISIS reducing regional stability. And you kind of see where each group interacts with the others. Now, when you come over to regional stability, you realize it's much more important and a bigger problem we might need to fix because it affects the presidential election, the parliamentary elections, uh, increased activity by the Israeli military, increased activity by the Islamic State, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, refugee population, up here is the um, Lebanese army, and so different issues have different effects on the issue you're studying. And so this was a very big tool that we used to play around with different <coughs> scenarios and different outcomes. Uh, may I ask a question? Of course. Did, are, are you saying that uh, our, the, the United States' ability to affect regional stability mm -hmm. is very important to Lebanon's stability. 
maybe not the United States specifically, yeah. but regional stability in general has a very mm -hmm. big influence. So right now the United States, and let me move this up a little bit so we can see the whole map. The United States has enacted sanctions on banks within Lebanon to try to stop the movement of money controlled by Hezbollah. Part of the issue is, is Hezbollah does not use the Lebanese banking system. So really, we're not affecting Hezbollah so much as we are inconveniencing people trying to run small businesses. Um, and so constitutional violations by the government, not having elections, allowing Hezbollah to have seats in parliament, have brought on sanctions. Increased sanctions in Hezbollah have brought on U.S. sanctions. Um, however, the U.S. Strength sanctions have damaged successful infrastructure. They don't have a successful banking system. It is maybe leading to an economic slowdown. And this economic slowdown is also creating a poor infrastructure. So maybe our sanctions might not be the best way to aid Lebanon and deal with Hezbollah. Right. That's going to... Um... Has Hezbollah uh, has his own militia, his own army. Right? Yes. So is the Lebanese army um, equal to them, or they are superior? Um, are they superior? Yes, the Lebanese army is superior to the Hezbollah militia. They're not allowed to integrate. If you align yourself with Hezbollah, you are not allowed to enter the Lebanese army. Um, However, the Lebanese army does not directly combat Hezbollah. Right. Depending on the issue, they may be fighting side by side, although they're not government sanctioned. If they're fighting a battle with Israel, Hezbollah is going to be on the side of the Lebanese army. If they're fighting a battle with Syria, they're going to be fighting against Hezbollah because of those religious lines. Well, <laughs> it's, it, it's very complicated, and the problem with Lebanon different from other countries is the alliances don't fall specifically on religious lines. You have Sunnis and Christians that might be against Shia. You have Shia and Sunnis who might be against Christian, but looking at any individual Sunni, you don't know who they align with. Yes? And back to the point, I think if I understood correctly, mm -hmm. the Saudis were cutting back on military support. Mm -hmm. Is that going to the Lebanese military? Yes. So in other words, when they cut back on the support to the Lebanese mm -hmm. military, then that brings down the strength, the monetary strength mm -hmm. of the military, because you said they're the largest employers. Yes. So then you have a defection, uh, uh, an economic defection. Essentially. From the military, and that further undermines the stability of the nation, both economically and socially. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the reason they're cutting back, and the reason the GCC countries are cutting back, is Lebanon made a series of promises to these countries to get that funding and to allow these workers into their countries that they were going to crack down on Hezbollah, not let them do a certain amount of things in civil society, and they haven't done that. So Saudi Arabia and the UAE, etc., like told Lebanon, now we're no longer going to fund you. Um, and when we go look at regional stability, Lebanon is on the front line fight of ISIS and other Islamic extremist groups. Um, they have attacks in their country, they have battles in their country against these different groups, and cutting the funding to their military has become an issue on how well they can combat these groups. So, one of our last things that I will talk about is our use of game theory. We ran a number of cooperative games um, to tease out our different scenarios and cooperative games are where the players in each of these games are able to follow a given set of rules. They can also choose to break them, but there is a given set of rules for these games. Um, each player, Parliament of Les Lebanon, Hezbollah, the alliances, etc., all have a specific outcome that they would like to see. And then, after all of the math, etc., you have a first cut. And so the first cut after the mathematical equations say that we are going to either maintain the status quo in Lebanon, or we're going to see an election of a new Christian president. After the second cut, which is more in-depth math, we'll see either the status quo change with a election of a Christian president, or a hybrid government that is has two different bodies of parliament. One is secular, one is non-secular. There is, of course, always an alternative scenario to things that we predict. 
Um, the civil society of Lebanon has lost all faith in its ability to have parliament do its job and effectively govern. Uh, should presidential elections not occur uh, successfully in the next 12 months, these protests are more likely to become more violent. And in an extreme case, if a civil war occurs, it's not going to be a civil war like we see in Syria, where Assad is fighting to maintain control of the state against his people. You are going to see, because the government has so little control over the people who have elected them, you're going to see a split on the March 8th, March 14th lines, where different factions of the government will break off, the military is not likely to support one side or the other, and we're going back to a civil war that we've seen of recent proportion. Uh, implications and outlook. Current analysis shows that there will be a successful president, pres presidential election in the next 12 months. Um, experts say it's going to be Michel Un, who will win. He is pro Hezbollah and a March 8th uh, alliance supporter. But he's a Christian, isn't he? But he is a Christian. And that's where it gets really complicated in Lebanon. Wow. You wouldn't suspect a Maronite Christian to be pro Hezbollah. But both of the candidates running right now are Maronite Christians. Both of them are pro Hezbollah and have the support of the leader of Hezbollah. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a mind blowing activity. Um, presidential and and subsequent parliamentary elections will have a stabilizing effect in the country, allowing it to govern, and will hopefully have a stabilizing effect in the region. Um, if, however, the alternative scenario happens to the extreme and there's a civil war, last time Saudi Arabia and Syria both intervened on behalf of Lebanon. Uh, Saudi Arabia brokered the deal, Syria essentially ran the country until the Syrian revolution, where Lebanon took back over. However, Syria is not in a place where it can run its own country, much less intervene in another, and Saudi Arabia and Iran are almost in a proxy war when it comes to the politics of Lebanon. The United States hasn't shown any interest in also being a broker for new elections, and so the four main players don't seem to be taking a stake in this country. Um, therefore, a civil war may last indefinitely, like we see somewhere in uh, Sudan, South Sudan, where regional players as well as the world powers don't see it as an issue, and therefore we just let it smolder. Mm -hmm. So, are there any questions? <laughs> yes? Yeah. Is there, do you know why the, the Christians are, those two Christian guys are supporting Hezbollah, even though... Yes. It doesn't seem to be, is it, are they threatened by Israel? Is there some overarching geostrategic reason? So part of it is uh, threat of Israel, especially with being cut back on military funding. Um, the other issue is Lebanon is a little more mixed than this map, but this is essentially the breakdown of where people live by religion. Both of the presidential candidates come from a predominantly Shia area. With Hezbollah being a Shia group, they take their base of supporters because whether you're a Christian or not, you vote for president. Right. Their base of supporters are predominantly Shia from lo a local look. And therefore, Hezbollah supports them. They support Hezbollah because that's their base. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? What kind of software is The game theory analysis, because it was so basic, we actually did through Excel. Yep. So there are approximately 1 million to 1.5 million Syrian refugees within the country. Mm -hmm. How is their presence um, affecting the current presidential outlook um, going forward? So right now, these refugees are settled mostly in this area here, they come across the border from Syria for the most part, as well though as from areas occupied by the Palestinians. Um, they don't have any status, so they can't become citizens, they don't have citizenship of their own, and because Lebanon did not sign on to, I think it's the 1951 Refugee Convention, they don't, they're not legally bound to accept refugees. So these are just people in camps, they can't get jobs, they can't apply for citizenship, and they really don't have a future. Now there's legislation that some of the Muslim, predominantly Shia 
Muslim parliamentary members are trying to pass so they can become citizens and therefore eligible to vote. In this current political election cycle, there's not a big effect by the refugees because they're not able to vote. However, they put a lot of pressure on the infrastructure. They don't have a whole bunch of friends from Lebanese civilians and citizens because they believe that they're sucking resources off. However, if these people were allowed to become citizens and then a census was done to determine the seats in parliament, Christians would not only be half, not half the population, they would be less than a third of the population. And so realigning all of those seats would make the Christian population very unhappy and they would feel very threatened. That answer your question? It, yeah. Okay. That's where I was going. <laughs> yes. So, would you say then that the present alignment between the Christian community, mm -hmm. as represented by the two leading people that we for the uh, presidency mm -hmm. and uh, Hezbollah, maybe is a reflection of, of a greater mutual interest in the nation than in again in uh, the segments that have been already predefined by the confessional structure mm -hmm. that they have. So we may be seeing a positive move towards a more melding of national interests over over individual religious driven interests. And you can see that in civil society, a lot of civilians as well as military leaders that I spoke to for this uh, particular paper, um, they want to see a more inclusive government. They don't want to see a split between Muslims and Christians. The issue with this is, is no one knows how to do it. They don't know how to have a free election where you can earn a seat regardless of your religion because, again, the Christians don't want this because they're afraid they're going to lose all these seats. The Sunnis might not want it in a certain area because now the population is more of a Shia-dominated area. And although they do not specifically align themselves with their religion more than as, I'm a Lebanese citizen, there is still that fear that the country is no longer going to be this, they consider themselves a melting pot. But based on now how the Christians and Muslims separate by population um, in number, they believe that they're not going to have that Christian face anymore because there are so many Muslims in the country. Um, it is actually one of the things that I discussed with some of the leaders of the military as well as some of the civilians is the most welcome outcome would be a military coup because the military is so beloved in the country. However, the issue with the military coup is once the government is ousted, no one knows what to do next. And the fear is, is of course, that something worse is going to come about. That one man will step up and be a dictator and they will lose any sense of democracy that they have. Did you travel there personally? Hmm? Did you? No, I did not travel there personally. Um, I was at the Army War College last year oh, okay. for a class, and they had several Lebanese representatives as well as some at NDU. And so them and a couple of their coworkers have helped me out with my research over the past year. I have a nephew that went there for a year to mm -hmm. do uh, to work out with an orphanage and whatever. He's in the order of mother. And he came and got his math there. He loved the country. It's supposed to be very beautiful. I would like to go eventually, despite what my mother would like. <laughs> but um, right now, it is it is relatively dangerous in certain areas yeah. because of ISIS. Yeah, that was five years ago. Ah, <laughs> you had a question, Steve? Yeah. Um, so you kind of presented us a lot of um, bad things going on in mm -hmm. Lebanon. Are there any uh, areas of uh, you know optimism? Things that uh, you should look for the global community. You should look for um, that are you know good indicators of progress. Currently, I wouldn't say good indicators of progress. Potential progress. Um, Lebanon, when you compare it to the rest of the region, is still kind of a shining star because of one how people identify themselves. If you were to survey a number of Lebanese citizens, which I did for a separate project. They do not identify by religion or I am Arab versus I am French versus 
et cetera, et cetera, they identify themselves as Lebanese, the same way we identify ourselves as Americans instead of Christian, Muslim, Republican, Democrat. When someone asks what you are, we would say we're an American when asked by a foreigner. Um, additionally, this is one of the most well-adjusted countries when you look at how different religions where religious schisms dominate the region, where different religions are living together and doing so very well. Um, on the national political level, they're not doing so great, but in local political level as well as local civil society, school districts, uh, different infrastructure projects, how they have integrated their military based on religion, based on where they live, based on socioeconomics, Lebanon is light years ahead of the rest of the region. Did you have a, a question? Yeah, just for a point of reference, mm -hmm. how big is the population and how large physically is Lebanon? I believe Lebanon is roughly the size of if you put Connecticut and Rhode Island together. So it's a very, very small country. And I believe there are less than six million people, with most of them living in uh, Beirut and Tripoli. A lot of Lebanon is very Tripoli. Um, a lot of Lebanon is very rural, very mountainous, so they're heavily concentrated in each of these uh, cities. And again, I'm not sure if we can tell by the map, but Beirut, being this small, has three different districts uh, for elections, where Tripoli is another one of the smaller districts just because it is such a concentrated area, where you have what we saw on the map is Shia populations, but they're out in the mountains and they're out in the rural areas, so their voting districts are much larger because the population isn't as concentrated. Yes. Uh, what recommendations would you give to U.S. policymakers? A good question. Yikes. So, my big recommendation when asked for this paper was we either need to be serious and have a real strategy of how we're going to deal with Lebanon, or we need to be hands off and let them do it on their own. Us kind of tinkering in Lebanon over the past couple of years, even over the past decade, has not been very successful. Uh, the most recent example of the bank sanctions is one of those things where we're actually harming civil society. Um, we're trying to combat terrorism, but we are harming a already struggling economy. Um, I recommend we approach it carefully because of our relationship with Israel and uh, Lebanon and Israel's relationship. If we help Lebanon too much or we support one candidate over another, we're going to strain an already strained relationship with Israel. But providing things like election monitors, providing not military weapons, but military training. Um, we already do a lot of exchange programs with our military, but keeping those up, um, bringing in our National Guard for the state partnership program training exercises would be another thing to recommend because they are, along with some of those other countries, Syria included, on the front lines of fighting the expansion of ISIS. And so they're even better than we are at fighting those type of wars, but giving them the resources they need to fight those type of wars. Yes? What recommendations would you give foreign companies looking at trying to do business, deciding to do business mm -hmm. or not in Lebanon? I think it's a great, it, it is a great place to do business. Um, their infrastructure is not the best. It was maybe 20 years ago. Um, before the Civil War, it was a great place to do business. It was a great place to be a tourist. And those abilities are still there. However, it is going to take more capital now than it would have 20 years ago because of the infrastructure decline. So it is a great place to do business uh, if you're an international company. Despite the travel bans, Beirut is an international hub for the Middle East. You have a lot of people coming from Europe, North Africa, um, Central Asia as well as the peninsula to do business there, to vacation there, so you would get a lot of global reach setting up in Beirut where you might not do that in Morocco or Algeria or Syria, of course. Um, it's, it's a safe place to be an American, it's a safe place to be a European, uh, so international businesses setting up in Beirut or even Tripoli would be 
it'd, it'd be a better place than somewhere else in the region. Anyone else? Thank you guys so much. Thank you.